and I want everyone to be on board with our church's mission statement. The bulletin insert that you have today is our MVP statement. That's a, that's a short abbreviation for our mission statement, our vision, and our purpose. And uh, you all have that, that little bullet insert with you. Uh, says our mission statement is to, is to reach, teach, mend, and sin. And I want you all to have that in your minds because uh, this is why we exist as a church, to reach, teach, mend, and sin. And um, I put it that way because it'll, it's easy to remember. It'll help you just kind of hold on to it in your thoughts. And every one of those aspects means something. Every one of those words, reach, teach, mend, and sin. And it says to reach everyone we can for Jesus Christ. There it is, just plain and simple. To teach them to be his disciples, to mend broken lives, and to send those that God would raise up out to repeat this process. That's why we're here, to reach, teach, mend, and send. We're not just here to have church and make ourselves feel good, but uh, we are a, uh, a small, we are a microcosm of the kingdom. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that incorporates this. We want to reach people. We want to teach them to be his disciples, to teach them to follow him. And uh, men broken lives and send them out. And so I want to flesh this out a little bit, this idea of reach, teach men and sin our mission statement, and we'll talk about some of the other things on another day, our vision, our purpose. But today, you know, I, I, I give you our, this, our, this mission statement, reach, teach, men, and sin. You know, um, are, were you previously unaware of this? I think most people are. Again, it is why we exist as a church, and remember that we are not just here to have church and pat each other on the back and say, don't we feel good about ourselves. We are here to advance and spread the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Maybe you are unsure. Um, that's what the church is. It is. It is supposed to be a physical manifestation of the kingdom on the ground, where uh, the people, their lives have been changed by the presence of Jesus, where they uh, they learn to to love and fellowship with one another, where they uh, learn to serve and honor the King and worship. It changes our lives. You know, we talk about our great mission. Jesus gave some instructions just before he left earth, just before he ascended into heaven. And we call it the Great Commission. And I'll give you the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven, excuse me, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Yeah, now with that statement, he speaks from a position of great authority as he commissions his disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yes, our church's mission statement to reach, teach men and saints is closely tied to this, the Great Commission. We are, we are to go into all nations and make disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And that's a part of our Christianity too, the idea of teaching him, teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded. And you notice that he didn't say, in, encourage them to go along with everything I suggest. <laughs> okay? He said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. So, the idea of the first word, reach, it means to reach everyone we can for Jesus Christ. Now, I need to I ask you a question here. Talk about reaching everyone we can for Jesus Christ. How many of you really believe what the Bible says? Okay, I mean, seriously, you really believe what the Bible says? The Bible says that those who don't have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will miss heaven and go to hell. Hello. Those who don't have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will miss heaven and go to hell. Now, this should motivate us to reach other people. Okay? Jesus said, Plainly, he says uh, in, in John uh, chapter 8, he says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. That's heavy. <laughs> Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, those are just a couple of verses. I, I'm sure I could have given you more. The idea that there is no other way to get to heaven. And when you leave here, there is only heaven or hell. Those are the only two options. Only two choices. And we choose which one we're going to here on earth. That's why I asked you the question, how many of you really believe what the Bible says? And, and that question is an important one because in our culture today, there are a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus. A lot of people who have some other form of religious practice that is not Christianity. Um, some people just believe in humanism. Believe, I just believe in me. What do you believe in? I believe in me. <laughs> some people, because in our, our culture has exalted one's personal opinion, some people make up their own mixture of what they want to believe. They, pick and choose. I don't, I don't like that. I don't believe that. I believe this. I believe it's like this. And they kind of make up their own Bible. Their own rules for eternity. That would work if we got to make up the rules for eternity. But we don't. Now, in our culture, and we are all a part of our culture, we practice political correctness. As we are a part of the kingdom of God, 
as we are citizens of the kingdom of God, we cannot be politically correct because political correctness often runs contrary to what the word of God has to say. Our culture says, listen, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe. I believe I, I, in God my way. And uh, this one over here, he believes in his way. And, and I'm sure if we're all good people, we'll all just, we'll, we'll work it all out. God will work it all out in the end. In other words, the, the idea that there are many roads to heaven. The, uh, the over a billion people who bow regularly uh, in Islamic prayer. The Hindus, the Baha'is, the Buddhists, so on and so forth. And whatever, whatever other faith you want to name, if they don't know Jesus, they miss heaven. <coughs> now, again, that's not politically correct, but it's real. So we're dealing with the first word of our mission statement is to reach. This is why we need to reach people. Because they will miss heaven. And that's why I asked you, first of all, do you really believe what the Bible says? Because I'm just giving you what the Word of God has to say. We need to reach them because God cares for them. Yes, God cares for them. And loving people enough says that we should reach them. Love them enough to reach out to them. Remember that every person who is not a believer in Jesus Christ is on their way to hell. Okay, that's a harsh reality. Now, the question is, when you show the love of the Lord enough to care, to intervene. You see, this is where political correctness comes in. Political correctness just says, well, you, I believe what I believe. I know you don't believe in Jesus, but, you know, I, I still love you anyway, and that's okay, and I just want to be cool with you. And I do want to be cool with all of them. But I need to tell them what's going to really save their souls. Some may not want to hear it. Some will listen politely. But I have this comfort, this reassurance that I know that, uh, that I have the Holy Spirit working with me. And it is just not me talking. The Lord knows how to make my meager, humble words have great impact on their souls. So the question is again, will we love them enough to reach out and intervene? Some people say that the opposite of love is hate. But that's not true. The opposite of love is indifference. Okay? The opposite of love is, oh well, but they're going to hell. That's on them. Bye. Uh, the opposite of love is to look at people who are going to hell and just don't give a rip. Okay. We're to reach them. Tell them about Jesus. If you don't feel like a great evangelist, bring them to church. I'll tell them about Jesus. We'll tell them together. Let them stand and, and worship with us as we worship the Lord. Let them listen to the word of God with us. Let them sense the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Okay? 
Again, this is not all about how clever we are and being able to be persuasive. This is about exposing people to the truth of the Word of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're called to reach, teach men and sin. Let's talk about teaching. Part of the Great Commission is to teach them to obey everything he has commanded us. That's important. Hosea chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Destroyed from lack of knowledge. See, this is one of the reasons it is appropriate for the people to be taught. Because people have their own ideas about what Christianity is, what, what their souls are. Do, the, do I even have a soul, a spirit? I know people who say, no, I don't. Think that we're all just like the dog or the cat. When we die, that's it. Colossians, Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mercy, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The teaching is necessary that we might present people perfect in Christ. Yes. You see, the idea of reaching them is wonderful. But a lot of folks don't realize that they need the teaching. Yes. Because they don't know what it means to walk with God or, or how to walk with God. Um, um, a lot of folks in this generation don't really think that they need to go to church. And I would say you need to come together with the, with the believers. Church is the building. Church is the, is the people. Amen. Church is the, the word what we call church is uh, the Greek word ekklesia. It means the gathering. Okay, not the building. Right. We are the church gathered. We are the ecclesia. And in this gathering, we are taught by experience how to deal with other people in love. This way you get to practice that. Okay? This is where we learn to work with one another and, and gain maturity. This is where your, your, your spiritual gifts get to be exercised. That's teaching also. In 2 John 1, 9, it says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both God, excuse me, has both the Father and the Son. Amen. This is, again, one of the reasons that we come to church, for the teaching. And this is one of the reasons that we stress membership. Because we must be committed to the process. Being committed to the, part of being committed to the process of learning is being committed to uh, the people that the Lord has set us in amongst, amid, in their midst to learn from. We have to learn to be committed to his local church that you might learn to serve and experience the things that you must be taught. 
Let me say this. The last thing I want to say about this teach topic. Teach people with your life. Okay? The old saying that you may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. Teach people with your life. And let me encourage you again. Bring them to church with you. Bring them to teaching. Again, the cool thing about bringing people to church with you is you bring them in and to expose them to the anointing. And it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that reaches them in a way that you probably never could. Bring them into the midst. Again, our mission statement is to reach, teach. Somebody give me the other two words. Men and sin. Okay, reach, teach, men and sin. Send. <laughs> Not sin. Let's talk about mend. What does it mean to mend? It means to, to repair. We get a needle and thread and mend a tear in a, in, a, in a torn garment. Reach, teach, mend, and send. Teach them to be his disciples and to mend, mend broken lives. Jesus men's broken lives. And lives are broken all around us. Yes. Okay, we all know people who you know and love and you think that their, their lives are kind of messed up. Their lives need mending. People who've gone through all sorts of things. And they're just, they're just trying to walk through life and be, look normal. Their lives need mending. But good news, one of the big things that Jesus does for us when we come to him is that he mends our lives. Okay? He fixes broken lives. He fixed mine. And let me give you uh, an extreme case, as, as we like to say in our culture today, a, a worst case scenario. Right out of scripture, inside of Luke chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples were in a boat. And it says in Luke chapter 8, verse 26, and that they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. The Gerasenes are people who live in the city of Gerasa. Okay? The region of the Gerasenes, in other words, is the region of these people. Um, um, studies of the region and other, other uh, gospels place, place it in the region of the Gadarenes. Okay, the Gadarenes are the people who live in Gadara. And we think that this really happened in the region of the, the Gadarenes. There was a cluster of, of ten cities in the, in the region. That, that those ten cities were called the Decapolis. Deca, ten, Apolis cities. It just means ten cities. And uh, Garasa and Gadara were part of those two cities. Part of those ten cities. cities uh, excuse me. Okay, i just give you that as a side note, because I think that's important for you to have in your mind. They, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house. But he lived in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice. He was screaming. 
And you say, get the picture. Jesus stepped out on the shore. Here comes a man running up to him, buck naked. Demon possessed, shouting at the top of his voice, shouting as loud as he could. What do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken the chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. That's heavy. Uh, I, I won't we won't talk about the abyss at the moment, but uh, this man had many demons in him. And uh, Jesus said, what's your name? He said, Legion. Um, and and it's, it's using Rome, the Roman soldiers as a reference point because many a legion of Roman soldiers was, I have heard uh, too many numbers by people who uh, uh, supposedly know, some say a thousand, some say a legion was six thousand. It depends. Yeah, it depends, okay. And uh, by now, by the next verse, A large herd of pigs were feeding there on the hillside. Okay, now the, that herd of pigs, uh, by the so-called historians, numbered around 2,000. A large, large herd of pigs were there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They had never seen anything like this. It scared them. The fact that Jesus fixed this boy. They found the man dressed sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind. Okay, now what this is, now this, this is a great story. I told you that it was a worst case scenario. But this is a great example of how Jesus mends broken lives. And I, after reading this story, is there anyone who could say that his life was not broken? His life didn't need bending? Jesus mended a broken life with the authority of heaven. Remember Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He gives us authority too. Now, what caused the man to be demon possessed to such an extent? We don't know. Being out of the will of God for his life in some area, I'm sure open this open this up for him. Probably a sin of some sort. But Jesus mended his messed up life. 
And, and the common thread in this story with so many nowadays is that sin messes up life in so many ways. Sin messes up life causing people to, to, to need a recovery program of one sort or another. Sin messes up life. I have met people who were molested repeatedly as children. And it was sin that was pushed on them by someone else and it messed up their lives. Jesus mends broken lives. And he mends them in love. And the cool part, what I want you to see about this, the story that we just read, Jesus stepped out of the boat and uh, demons ran up to Jesus saying, oh, they saw Jesus and said, uh-oh. And he came up to him screaming, you know, look, we know who you are. What you come here for? Don't, don't mess with us. I love this because it shows you the devil knows who the boss is. Amen. Okay? It's not like that stuff you see in those silly horror movies where the, where the devil is so strong and the people are all just victims. The devil is going to have a heyday. No. The demons know who the boss is. Okay, so, when Jesus was met by the demon-possessed man who came up running up to him naked, he loved him. And it is the, his love for the man that immediately began to set him free. Jesus started saying, okay, come out of him, come out of him. And uh, so then the demon said, no, no, why are you messing with us? They knew they had to come out, but they just started to, wanted to bargain a little bit as to where they had to go. Jesus mended his life. See, this is one of the reasons we reach out to people to bring them to Christ. Because Jesus fixes their lives. Some of the messed up, most messed up people you know are the people who need Jesus the worst. Bring them to Jesus. Men with broken lives. And lastly, said, so reach, teach, mend, and send. It means to send those that the Lord would raise up out to repeat this process of reaching and teaching and mending. Yes, the Lord sends people out. The Lord sent me out. I know about this firsthand. I was surprised. Uh, the way that it happened. I knew that it was going to happen. I didn't know how. It, it has been the plan of the Lord in my, on my life ever since I was a kid that I would do this. Okay. Before I even knew who I was in Christ. Listen, I wasn't even walking with God. Okay? I was I was raised in church, brought to Sunday school every Sunday as a little kid, grew up in the church. I was, they say, I was one of those little kids uh, who, was, who was on drugs. Every Sunday I was drugged at church. Okay? Every Sunday I was drugged to church. And uh, I can remember being a little kid in Sunday school, coloring with crayons and stuff, and listening to the Bible lessons. 
But as a teenager, I was doing my own thing. I wouldn't walk with God. But God had his hand on me. And um, I told you this before. Uh, a little old lady who was uh, uh, the grandmother of a dear friend of mine. I was over at his house. And this little old lady, which I now realize was just someone who had been walking with Jesus for years and uh, had discernment in the Holy Spirit, walked past me on a cane and said, and stopped and looked at me and pointed her finger at me like this. And I was, what, maybe 15, okay? 15, and I'm not thinking about walking with God, I was thinking about having fun, thinking about girls, so on and so forth, you, okay? <laughs> you know, 15-year-old boy, okay? She pointed her finger at me, she said, boy, you're gonna be a preacher. And I said, what? What makes you think that? And that was the end of the conversation. She, she, said, she said, oh, I know. And kept on moving. Okay. Okay. And lo and behold, years later, I find myself called to the ministry, and, and I've been here pastoring this church now for 28 years. God does send. You may not think you might be the, one of the ones sent. Oh, <laughs> but you have, he, he knows how to surprise you. And there are many ways that he can send you. Many ways that he can send you. He may not send you into the pastor. Uh, but he may just send you out into your workplace. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. To go out there and shine a light. Because the light needs shining where you work. You may not be able to get those folks to come to church. You take the church to them. And what I mean by that is that you are the church. You are part of the ecclesia. While they were worshiping, this is out of the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and, and Saul for the, for the work to which I have called them. See, Barnabas and Saul may not have known about the work that God had called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them. They laid hands on them and sent them off. The two of them uh, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to uh, Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at, at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. And John was with him as they helped them. The Lord said, set apart for me these two for the work to which I have called them. That's the way the Lord works. Some of you will be raised up by the Holy Spirit and called to go and minister to Jesus in the work that he has called you to. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the body of Christ is to be built up and he gifts us with these places in which we serve. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay, so I got the pastor spot. 
And my job is to prepare God's people for works of service. So I teach you the mission statement. Reach, teach men to sin. Understand that it, it, it is a sure outcome that some of you um, will be called into the ministry. Well, and I think it is a sure thing to believe that all of you will have a ministry of some sort. Everyone won't stand in the pulpit and preach. At least not a pulpit like this. But God will give you your own place to speak his word. Because he has put it in your heart and in your mouth. Here's the last scripture I'm going to give you as I bring this to a close. <laughs> All right. The last scripture. Uh-oh. Oh. oh, well. The last scripture isn't there. Let me read it to you. It's out of the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And remember, this, I mean, this is one of my, my favorite passages. Probably my very favorite out of the Old Testament. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord. And it's that in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted. He says, and, and, the, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he, he talks about this, this tremendous vision that he had of the Lord. And he says, woe is me for I have seen God and I have sinned in my life. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of the people with unclean lips. He says, in verse 6, he says, didn't one of the one of the uh, angels, one of the seraphs of the seraphim, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. But then he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your sin is taken away and atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. Okay, okay. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And again, I give you that scripture of the idea that Once his sin was atoned for, then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Once he was able to, to, to sense the great forgiveness of the Almighty, once he was able to hear how the clearly for the for one of the first times in his life, he said, send me, Lord. And as we feel and understand what it is to be forgiven by the grace of God, as we give ourselves to true discipleship, as we obey the Great Commission as a church, we come to the place as individuals where we say, here I am, send me. And this process repeats itself of reaching, teaching, mending, sending. So the quick first question is, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know, do you all know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you, have you submitted yourselves, as, as the Word of God says, to the apostles' teaching? Or even 
A further question, does your life need mending today? If so, good news, my Jesus who's here with us mends lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. Lord, now, if, there are, if there's anyone here who has yet to submit their lives to you, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here who has yet to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior, do so now. Pray this with me. Jesus, forgive me for my sins and come into my life. Make me yours. I take you as my Lord, the, the boss of my life, and my Savior, the one who saves me from my sins. Apply your grace and your goodness to my life. Help me to live for you. I know that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again on the third day. And that you are the Lord. Again, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. I give this life to you as much as I know how. Teach me how to live for you. And Father, I pray for those whose lives may be in need of mending. Lord, uh, fix what sin is messed up. Lord, let these lives be laid before you now in submission, Lord, that you might fix them. Lord, uh, I rebuke every hindering spirit, everything that would come against the knowledge of uh, our Savior. Let there be freedom in this house today. Father, men broken lives. Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts all the more and send us Lord, uh, you have reached us, you teach us, you mend us. Father, you send us. Have your will in our lives. Lord, and we would be honored to show others the way of life. Lord, we thank you. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um...